are very happy for him to be here, and we really look forward to learning about where we are. So, um, it's up to you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is, in fact, Bill Swain. Um, to produce a photo ID if you need me to. Um, so, I, so I was asked to present on uh, reservation history, which is a pretty broad topic, pretty big broad topic. Kind of on another note, I'm also the person who manages the program that provides funding for the after school program that takes place here yes. through the education department. Um, unfortunately, one thing we can't really do is provide construction money, which is really something I think that's probably needed over here. So. At any rate, uh, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about um, Flathead Reservation history and. My wife knows me well enough to where I generally have to preface this with, it's not about me. Um, but, I am a tribal member. I was raised in the Mission Valley at Post Creek, uh, which is God's country, as everyone knows. No offense to Hot Springs, but I was, I was actually born and raised right where the highway crosses 93, I'm sorry, right where Post Creek crosses Highway 93, about five miles north of the town of St. Ignatius. And I have a sister who lives there still. Uh, my education, I went to, ended up going to Ronan, actually. I was right on the Mission Charlo School District, so naturally I went to school in Ronan. Uh, attended the University of Montana, and I, as was already mentioned, I'm the education department head. So, of course, my major is wildlife biology. True story. So I have a master's degree in wildlife biology. Uh, I've spent most of my career in natural resource management and in education as well. I taught at Salish Kootenai College for 13 years before taking a break with this little girl. And um, I was going to go back for a PhD, but didn't make the grade. Anyway. And uh, Ruth Ann is here. She's my wife. And this is our daughter, Lily. And we're a blended family. We have two other boys at home that are 14 and 16. And they opted not to be here, <laughs> as teenage boys often do. <laughs> so, I don't know if you recognize anybody there. That's actually your Hot Springs High School. At, uh, they recently visited the Tribal Council Chambers, and so we had the opportunity to take a picture. The council is all behind, and that's a number of your Hot Springs students that came and visited us. So. What I do and don't know, I'm not very good pre-1855. I've got okay. some general information to talk about, even why the date 1855 is even a date that I would cut myself off at. Mm -hmm. And I'm not very good at uh, Kootenai history either, which is ironic because I'm actually a little more Kootenai than I am anything else. <laughs> but I will try to elaborate where I can, but if I don't know, I'm going to tell you I don't know. Okay. So, a lot of contemporary history, a lot of Salish Ponderé history, a little bit of Kootenai history, a little bit of pre-1855 is what we'll talk about. I plan to talk for, I don't know, the better part of the next, so we'll say 50 minutes or so. I'm a college instructor, there's, by trade, there will, be a, there will be a test after this, <laughs> a piece of paper, pencil. Um, and I am programmed for an hour and 20 minutes, so this is going to be difficult to cut it short. In terms of prehistory, pre-recorded history, pre-contact history, um, the time of creation is how it's generally referred to. And by the way, has anybody seen the card game? I meant to bring a copy. There's a card game of Salish Pondre Indigenous History. And you build a timeline is what you do. Each card is identical except the one side of the card has the date of an event. And one of those dates is time immemorial or the time of creation. Okay? So the time of creation uh, with the Salish people was a time when the Nafi Skyliktin roamed the land or Nafi Skylik as you see there. Literally people eaters. Okay, and there's a creation story that talks about uh, during this time, 
when the central creation figure in the Salish and Pondere creation stories made the world safe for people by dealing with the Nahli Skelikutin. Okay, they're the people eaters, the monsters on the land. And this is a very important and, and sensitive topic because the tendency that people have is to use the term legend or myth or fable. Um, we, I think you could, you could call it oral history. It's our oral history. Ours was an, obviously not a written history, so our, ours was an oral history. So our oral history talks about our historical occupancy upon the land and through the stories that were told, talks a lot about how animals came to be the way that they were, talks about physical features on the land with some very accurate descriptions from our oral history indicating that we've been here a very, very long time. There's some suggestions that go back to 40,000 years that the Salish and Pondere people have potentially occupied this site for as long as 40,000 years, and certainly back to the last ice age. So some of those place names are some of the oldest words that we know of in the language. And those place names may describe a singular event. They may describe a periodically, historically recurring event. Or they may describe so, just some physical feature on the landscape. Arli, um, Mchavk. Uh, where am I? Let me see. Plasi. Hmm. Stemplu Arli. Mchavk. 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 That's the place of the large diameter trees, for example. Mazula and Tai is the place of the trout. Tai is a trout, big, uh, big, big fish. Yeah, big place wolf, of the trout. trout. So there, there are these descriptive terms. There's these descri descriptive terms on the landscape that indicate either things that did once occur or have occurred continuously or periodically since that time. For example, the Kootenai people around the area of Dayton, if you're familiar with the lake, the Dayton Creek that flows into the, to the Flathead Lake, the Kootenai people referred to it as fish trout creek. And the reason for that was they would put those willow baskets in the creek when the fish spawned in such great numbers that it was, it was feasible to catch fish. And of course that doesn't happen anymore. So it tells us about historical conditions as well. So Fish Trap Creek, the spawning runs don't occur anymore. But the name that the Kootenai people gave that was Fish Trap Creek. So we also have some other indications that really are, are interesting. As Native peoples, we've, we've had this argument with um, modern science for forever. And that is a debate that we've all had. Did we cross the Bering Land Bridge? And there are, there are a lot of people who would say, no, we did not. And I'm going to give you one really interesting, compelling piece of information. The, number one, every tribe that we know of, they all say we've all pretty much always been here. Or there's a, there's a concrete origin story. Now, you take the Kootenai people, Let's start with the Salish people. The Salish and the Pondere people speak a similar language. They speak a language that's very similar. It's related to a bunch of other languages. The Nez Perce, the Colvilles, the Coeur d'Alene, the Spokans, all the way over to the coast. It's called the Salishan language family. The Kootenai people are a linguistic isolate. There are seven bands of Kootenai. There are two in, Mon in the United States, one here and one in Bonners Ferry, Idaho, and five in Canada. They're a linguistic isolate. No other tribe speaks any form of Kootenai, which suggests that they originated where they are. No other tribe speaks any language remotely similar to Kootenai. Linguistic isolate. Again, that would suggest that they originated where they are and have occupied that territory since the beginning of their time. So, interesting stuff. And again, we have, this is a, anybody recognize this? I kind of pilfered this. It's a Monty Dolak. Um, it's called Cliff Swallows. And, and he used kind of as some of his inspiration, some of the pictographs that are, 
that are present in several areas around the Flathead Reservation. Again, suggesting uh, a long history of occupancy here. So I won't say too much more about historical time. I'm not that familiar with it. Um, there was a time we know when, um, in our creation stories, we talked about times when animals conversed with people and interacted with people and with each other. And a lot of things took place, events took place that were descriptive of, of what happened on the landscape. Um, issues of morality and behavioral expectations and societal taboos, those kinds of things were told through the oral history, which is told in the wintertime with uh, coyote stories. You probably, some of you, if you've been here any length of time, you're probably familiar with the concept of coyote stories. So, in the early 1800s, about 1831, because there was a Salish prophet named Shining Shirt, and he foretold the coming of what they called the Black Robes, the Jesuit Fathers. And he, that was a very influential event for the people. And in about 1831, they began to inquire about this religion that they had heard of. And it em embodied some ideas that were similar to what the Salish Padre people thought. A singular, omnipotent being. A creator figure, Kulin uh, Sutin, uh, one that sits on the top, the one that's over everything. And they were interested in that, and they sent four separate delegations towards St. Louis to try to find somebody who would send black robes to teach them about this new language or this new religion that they had a lot of interest in learning more about. I think at least one of those parties, nobody was heard from again. It was a difficult time. Traveling through enemy territory, oftentimes the crows, uh, the Blackfeet that were out on the prairies as well. Um, and eventually, a delegation reached St. Louis and then the Black Robes came out, built the St. Ignatius Mission. We'll touch on that a little bit later on. So, so anyway, so prehistory then, or pre-1855, obviously there's a whole bunch of history. Now... I just came from Arlie School and asked this freshman through senior classes and the teachers that accompanied them, what date was the Hellgate Treaty signed? And I'd say of the people that I interacted with, more people than is in this room, I think about three or four people knew the answer, including teachers. Now I have a, an advantage because July 16th happens to be the birthday of one of my sisters, but at least 1855 is a date that anybody who lives here should know the significance of. July 16th, 1855, the Hellgate Treaty was signed. Um, this happens to be Council Grove. Anybody been to Council Grove? I, I, I live like three miles from there. I think I've been there twice. <coughs> but uh, So this is some signage at Council Grove. It's a state park. And at the time that the treaty was signed, I believe it wasn't uncommon that the interpreters were French and the language had to be translated from English into Salish and Pondere and then it had to be set, translated into Kootenai and then back into, from Kootenai, back into French, back into English. And a Jesuit observer at the treaty said he doubted that if 10% of the information that was being translated was even accurate based on the, the poor quality of translation. So it's certainly, it's certainly been documented that the, the, the native people did not really understand what they were agreeing to or they didn't agree to what the European people thought they agreed to and all of those kinds of things. So it's, important to, it's, it's also important to note that at least the Salish and Padre people were never at war with the United States. We were not conquered we, because we were not at war. Um, so it, it was basically an agreement. It was an agreement between sovereigns at that time. And so here's, so here's just a quick view. So this is uh, the airport, Missoula Airport, Highway 93. Here's the Y. And then here's Council Grove right here. This is Mullen Road that comes by right here. 
So that's uh, that's the location of uh, Council Grove State Park. If you ever get a chance, go take a look. My cousin Julie did a lot of work um, on the signage there. So I just wanted to show you in general where that is. So what the treaty did, the tribes reserved for themselves, we were not given, we reserved for ourselves the Flathead Indian Reservation. At least that's what we, that's what, that's what ended up happening. They also gave up some but not all of the rights that they had everywhere else which at the time was kind of defined as Western Montana. But we know we were in Idaho, we know we were in Canada, we know we were way over on the Milk River down in Yellowstone, and, and so into Wyoming and so forth. Um, we know that from our history. So, ah. so um, one of the things that happened, for example, was the tribes reserve the right to, they not only, see a treaty is not a granting of rights, it's a reservation of rights, and, then, and, then, and a reservation of land, hence the term reservation. So we reserve this for ourselves, and we also, res we not only said, we're not giving up any rights, we are going to specifically tell you about rights that we fully intend to keep. And Article 3 of the treaty was one that was the right to hunt and fish and pasture horses, and gather on open and unclaimed lands that had been traditionally used since time immemorial. And that was roughly defined at that time as Western Montana. <coughs> and now we know we have oral history that goes back to, to <coughs> buffalo hunts on the Milk River. We have oral history about buffalo hunts around Yellowstone, for example. Um, we have oral history that talks about why there are no salmon where we live. So there, there was clearly this, this the circle of life and the traveling that took place and the information that was exchanged that, that clearly established that we were not just in the intermountain region of western Montana. In fact, the Salish, the, the Ponderé, sometimes the Kootenai, sometimes other tribes would ally to actively go out east of the mountains to, for subsistence purposes historically and because it was a very difficult time, it was it was a it was a, a time where they would more than likely encounter Blackfeet, who they were sometimes friendly with, sometimes not. They would encounter Crows, who were sometimes friendly and sometimes not. Assiniboines, etc. Uh, some of the Sioux that that were getting pushed further and further east by or west by um, colonial expansion. So the the Salish people actively defended that area on the east side of the Continental Divide for, for a very long time to, in order to have the right to, to, or have the opportunity to hunt and fish and do the other things that they did there. So in the treaty there were certain promises, things like <coughs> hospitals and school buildings and so forth, which we think of now as health care and education. Those are treaty rights that are guaranteed to us by the government. Um, there was also because in particular, the Bitterroot Salish did not want to leave. They did not want to leave the area that they occupied historically south of Missoula. That in the treaty, language was written in for what was called a conditional reservation. Now, the treaty boundaries were defined in the treaty as where we are now. But one of the things that happened was in the treaty itself, it was written that a survey would be made of the Bitterroot Valley and if in the determination of um, territorial governor Isaac Stevens and whoever else was involved that it was better suited to the needs of the Indians then they would be allowed a reservation there. Now this was nothing more than a tool of placating the tribes because the survey was never done and the tribes were moved to the reservation was what happened. So this was, you can kind of, I was explaining there's a little interesting history, there's a, this map needs to be fixed, but it's the only one I could get. Um, so this was originally land status, we always put tribal, tribal land in green. There's a little blip up there on the north border, that's, uh, it's called that the Brown Ranch, I don't know if anybody remembers, just, just off the border up there by Nairata. 
Um, anyway, the tribes purchased like 13,000 acres up there, and so that's why that's, that should be taken off of there because it's been exchanged for other land now. I think the thinking at the time was the tribes would actually in, enlarge our reservation base, but that's, that's not going to work because it's, the, the boundary is defined by treaty. So this was just tribally owned land outside the reservation was all it was. Anyway, that's 1855 land status. Um, 1855 to 1887, uh, Congress actually ratified the treaty, and I think President Garfield, I believe it was, signed it in 1859. Um, a gold rush occurred in Montana, bringing more more uh, Europeans to this area. Um, most of the most of the tribal people didn't really move to the reservation until about 1873. Uh, they didn't really want to leave where they had been historically living. And, you know, certainly the Mission Valley is kind of the, you know, I think of it as the, the one that gets all the attention, the spectacular mountain peaks and so forth. It's hard to imagine that people had to be forced to move there, but that, that was the case. Um, 1887 was a, a very, very significant event, the Dawes Act, the Allotment Act. Some of you may, may have ended up coming here because of um, the actions that were subsequent to the Allotment Act. Um, We'll talk a little bit about that. Chief Charlo stayed in the Bitterroot with about 200 followers until 1891, when the, the army forcibly marched him um, up the Bitterroot Valley, across Hagen Street Bridge, up Everill Hill. And at that time, they, they stopped. And the first agency was actually in that area where the Jocko Church is, <laughs> off of Dirty Corner, that big sweeping corner in, uh, south of Arlene. There's a road that takes off straight to the east called the Agency Road, and right up there where the Jocko Church is, that was the site of the original Indian Agency. So the, the people all stopped, and they changed into their finery, and they made a big show and sang and, and, and hollered, and probably fired off guns or whatever as they came into the camp, because they, they didn't want people to think that they were um, you know, defeated or, or unhappy. They, they wanted to, to create a positive impression. So... Chief Charlo was, at that time, that band was the last remaining band anywhere in the nation that was not on a reservation and was forcibly moved there. A lot of people don't know that. So in 1887, the General Allotment Act, the Dawes Act, shifted fed federal policy. First, the government said, well, you're, you're, you're nations. We're going to treat you like nations. We're going to sign, have these agreements. Here's this roughly 1.3 million acre reservation for you to live on. Then, 30 years later, they said, the government said, we don't think you need all that land. Really what we think is, we're going to assign individual ownership. If you're head of household, 160 acres, 80 for your wife, 80 for each of your kids, go pick it out. Pick out where you want your allotment. Tribes didn't really know or understand that very well. And so roughly a million acres was not allotted. Was not allotted. Um, uh, in about 1903 there was there were records of among other things 27,000 head of cattle and 25,000 head of cattle which shortly after allotment dwindled down to less than 10,000 combined. Any farmers? Any farmers here? It's, uh, it's, if you farm around hot springs, it's, it's a tough go, isn't it? Uh, it's the driest place in western Montana. Average about 10 inches of rain, precipitation a year. It's probably the driest place in western Montana. Um, now the irrigation project, there was legislation passed in 1908. You've got the, the hot springs district over here, and the Jocko district, the St. Ignatius district. Um, <laughs> or maybe it's called the Camas District, um, actually resulted in more loss of land. It was supposed to benefit tribes. It was supposed to benefit the Indians, Indian irrigators. Turn them into farmers. The Dawes Act was designed to turn Indians into farmers. And you need water in western Montana. Hard to believe on a day like today, but you need water. And so the irrigation project was built and then people began to be assessed for water, and it's a pretty penny, isn't it, for water nowadays, uh, on a per acre basis. And 
and actually resulted in some people's land being lost because they couldn't pay their, their assessment, their O&M for their water. So more people lost land as a result of that. So this was the original allotment. Um, you see the orange there? I'm a little So this is 1908, 1909, sh uh, shortly after the Allotment Act was passed and when uh, individual allotments took place. You see the orange there. Um, of course, we're over here. We're, o we're over here on Hot Springs. And uh, so that's what the land ownership pattern looked like at that time. And you can see where, where Indians chose their allotments. A lot of them were in the sort of that Mission Valley area for Polson down towards our lee and in the, there in the Jocko Valley. So if we look at some of these things, railroad right of ways, almost 1,500 acres for railroad right of ways. Tribal people were saying, I don't, we don't understand. This isn't a very big area and you want five train depots here. Um, town sites, Polson, Polson was platted out. There are all these villa sites uh, around Big Arm and Elmo along the lake shore. Tribal people were not that interested in Lakeshore, but the non-Indians who came here saw it as, a, as very desirable. Um, so they snapped up town sites, uh, places for churches, power generation, uh, even for the Indian agency, and uh, for irrigation reservoirs. The school trust sites, um, something like 95 <coughs> sections. Sections 16 and 36 were set aside for the school, school trust as they are everywhere else. Tribe has been a considerable amount of time <coughs> purchasing land and then exchanging it for those purchasing land off the reservation and then exchanging it for those school <coughs> trust sites on the reservation. Uh, the bison range, 18,500 acres, that's been a big topic of discussion. What's going to happen there? Uh, it was a forced sale, uh, uh, like a penny, <coughs> a couple, couple, cents, uh, couple cents an acre, something like that. Um, and then things like, um, in, as soon as individual Indians owned land, they were told they owed property taxes, which was not true, to the state, which was not true. And those, those properties were illegally seized, and more land was lost. And uh, people that had unpaid bills, that, like the Missoula Mercantile, had their property seized for those kinds of things. Again, people... This was a very short amount of time in which the life ways of, of the people were completely altered in a very short amount of time. As I mentioned, we have the influence of the Catholic Church. I'm not sure what the date is on this one, but um, the Catholic Church was built. There was an Ursuline school built, the boarding school. The same things that happened there that happened with a lot of other tribes, except for, for the most part, we weren't... Our children weren't being sent, you know, hundreds of miles away, but it was a residential school for a while. It operated from 1880 something, 1890 something to 1972, and at that time it was a, it was just a day school. And my brother-in-law went there. A number of people that I know went to the Earth Lines in Saint Ignatius. And one, one nice thing about that now is, if you've been to where the Salish Pondre Culture Committee is. It's literally on the site where the Earth Lines was. So a site of a, 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 a building that is charged with cultural um, safeguarding and cultural perpetuation sits on the site where not very long ago those things were sort of systematically trying to be taken away from the tribes. It was the same things we've heard. I don't want to put a big downer on it, but you know, children were abused. Uh, they were forced to... Not, not speak their language, Tr the traditions were discouraged. And in some cases, parents felt that they didn't have any choice but to send their kids to the earth line so that they would be fed. That was what the conditions were like. <coughs> Another big topic of interest has been Kerr Dam. Uh, Kerr Dam was built in the 30s. My recollection was that the process started around 1930. Took about six years to build, somewhere in there, six to eight years. And I like to tell school kids, dams are like vehicles. You have to have a license to operate one. But the license that you get to operate a dam lasts 50 years. So the first dam must, have, the first license must have been issued in 1935. 
because in 1985 the new license uh, took effect. And I, I want to say, the first thing that the power company tried to do is they tried to say, well, that's not tribal land, we, we just want to take it. And it took some, I don't know, legal doing or political doing to say, no, that is in fact tribally owned land. That dam sits on the dam owners, Frank Kerr and the, and the power company that he owned, were responsible for rental payment. And it was something like $140,000 a year at that time. And, and by 1985, it was about two million and something. Two million annually. Something like that. So those provisions of the second license adjusted the payment to about nine million with annual increases according to the consumer price index and um, stipulated that the owners, that still was Montana Power at that time, would operate the dam for 30 years and then the tribes would operate it from 2015 forward. And 2015 seemed like a long time out there. Because I remember, I was Buddy Papin back there, he was squeezing fish and I was chasing geese around and, and 20, in, in 1985. And it seemed like 30 years was a long time and now it's almost been already a year that the tribes have owned the dam. So that was, a, that was a, certainly an a important historical point. So suddenly, this is land status 1922 to 1935, all of that pale color is all non-Indian owned land. And then there were the original allotments that we still see some in orange and then a second round of allotments where you see a lot of it is along the foothills, all along the foothills. Um, so that's, that was what in a very short amount of time, tremendous amount of land ownership change. Tremendous amount of land ownership change there. So this, this kind of outlines it a little bit from 18, uh, 1855 and then the allotments and then just not even uh, about 70 years later, there was this tremendous shift in land ownership. And a lot of land passed out of tribally owned hands um, basically the perimeter, just the mountainous areas, were what the tribes owned communally. A little bit along this little green ribbon, obviously, is the lower Flathead River. So it's, it's interesting to see that. And then this is the same map. And then this is, uh, this is pretty close to where we are today. Okay, this, that, this is land status 2008. I have a 2016 that I can't make into a nice neat map like this one, I don't know why. And you can see particularly this area where a lot of land was purchased, again up around Nairata, um, along the Salish Mountains. This piece here, this is all Ferry Basin. Um, and quite a bit down adjacent to the bison range and I think like this little piece right here is not green and so you can see the pattern of ownership some of it frankly is because the tribe just bought their our own members land who, who had land ownership but didn't want to didn't want to do anything with it so and then you see still the alternating state section 16 and 36 and here's one where we've acquired a little bit and again it was that one, this one here. Hi, sweetie. So a lot of changes. A lot of changes in land ownership over the years. And then again, so this is the not sexy map. This is the 2016 map. And again, there's, there's a little bit more green down here. But the pattern, the pattern from 2008 is, is a little, there's a little more green in the map. Not a huge amount more, but um, from an absolute sense, that is. So that's kind of where we're at today with land ownership. So after allotment, after homesteading, we had uh, the 1930s to 60s where the federal government again said, well, now we're going to change this. It's still not working. What we're doing is we tried treating them sovereign, and then we tried to take all their land away and allot it all out and take the rest. Now we're going to do something different. We're going to have the it's called the Wheeler Howard Act or the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934. 
So we had to get ourselves reorganized, I guess. We were disorganized or something. <laughs> so what it allowed was tribes could opt to organize into a new system of government. And that government was the government that we have today. Tribal council is not a traditional form of government. What I remember people talking about was we had chiefs. We had some chiefs and then we had maybe some people below them. And chiefs would say, well, I think we should probably do this. And people would go, hmm. And they would either do it or not. You know, they would either do it or not. And, and if a, a chief was a person of sufficient vision and integrity and leadership and intelligence to make good decisions, people would follow him. People would follow that. Now we have this tribal council system. So Wheeler Howard Act, Indian Reorganization Act, Act of 1934, in 1935, the Salish and Kootenai tribes were the first tribes in the nation to write an IRA document and reorganize under this act. Very first tribes in the nation to do that. So we established a tribal council system. And on that council were two chiefs, and the Pondere people were completely dismissed. Even though there were still traditional Pondere elements, there was a Pondere chief. He was not included on the original, uh, as a member of the original tribal council. At that time, it was ten people, and the two chiefs, one Kootenai chief and one Salish chief. That was about, and again, that was 1935. So... Just a few years later, because we can't get comfortable, the era of termination. Now, I remember termination. I wasn't alive in the 50s, but I was alive in the 60s. Termination meant, okay, none of this is working. We're going to just eliminate tribes altogether from having any special status, any land base, any anything. We're going to try that. And they terminated some tribes. And you know who the first tribe they came after was? The Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes were the first tribes tar targeted for termination. And they fought it off. So they went after the Menominee and they terminated them out in Wisconsin. They went after the Klamath out in Oregon. They terminated them. They went after some California rancherias and they terminated them. And it was devastating. And, and the Menominee, I know, and the Klamath, for example, have reasserted their tribal identity and got federally recognized again after a period that just devastated. They were just devastated. Um, but I was, I want to say about eight or ten years old, and, and at this time, the agency was in Dixon. The seat of the tribal government was at Dixon at the agency. And the BIA was there. And I remember going there with my dad, and they were talking about termination. This was still in the 60s. And people were saying, hey, you know, we could, we could get some money. We could get some money if they terminate us. And I remember thinking, if we're terminated, does that mean I'm not brown anymore? That was my understanding of what was going on. And I looked at the missions and thought, you know, what is that worth? What is that worth to me, even at the age of being, you know, 10 years old? But it, it was real, and I remember that. And, and, there were, and again, there was tribal leadership advocating for it in the late 60s. And then there were people that were saying, no, we're, we're, we are not for sale, basically. So termination for this reservation, although we were the first target, we successfully fended that off until um, it kind of went away in, in the late 60s. In the 1970s, because we can't get too comfortable, we now have a new, yet another new era. And you know, for all of his, whoa, what happened? It was the 70s. <laughs> it was the 70s. It was just the 70s, wasn't it? We, we couldn't get comfortable again. And the new policy, after they just after the federal government just tried termination, and along with termination was this lovely thing called relocation. Mm -hmm. 
Anybody remember relocation? Indian people were, were identified, targeted, and they were given like a little kit that included an alarm clock. And they were sent off to some urban area because the alarm clock was so they'd remember to wake up to go to work. And my dad, who, was a, who became a tribal chairman and a, a very well-known advocate for tribal sovereignty, at one time worked as a relocation officer for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And we ourselves were relocated to Riverside, California, and we didn't make it a year and came home, luckily. So now there's, there's this policy of self-governance that came about in the 70s. 1973, in uh, Public Law 93-638, the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act. So what, what this law said was, no, tribes really have the right to govern their own affairs. And here's a process by which we can do this. Now what used to happen was, if you're familiar with how tribal governments work and the BIA and all that, a lot of people used to assume that the BIA was the tribe. It's not. The BIA is a federal agency who manages the tribe's affairs. So in part, what 93638 did was it said, if the tribe can prove that they're capable of assuming a program, then rather than give the money to the BIA, we'll just give it straight to the tribes. And they can implement the program. Okay? Hope there's no former BIA people here. Because I have this joke. I always have this joke, and it's just a joke. Um, but the BIA doesn't have real positive reputation with a lot of tribal people. And, and I'm told that the reason is because when Custer left Washington, D.C., he told the BIA, don't do anything till I get back. <laughs> anyway, I, I know some pretty good people in the BIA that have done the best that they could. But, um, but so this era of self-governance starts to come along. And, and for all of the flack that people gave Richard Nixon and what his legacy was, he was pretty good to Indians. He was pretty good to Indian people. He was pretty good to the environment. Um, and, but it is what it is today. So uh, again, at this time from our history, this was the, the foundation of Two Eagle River School, which originated in Dixon and then moved to Pablo, and the founding of Salish Community College. So a lot of, a lot of things starting to happen. Um, in the 1980s, again, we saw a lot of growth in the government. Um, for example, the Natural Resources Department, something that I was very proud to be a part of uh, at that time. And we established a number of programs that were very central to pr protection of the unique natural environment of the Flathead Reservation. And those included air quality. We were... If you talk to the Northern Cheyennes, they're going to say they beat us by a couple of months. But basically, us and the Northern Cheyennes voluntarily adopted Class 1 air designations at the same time. The same designation that you would have for a national park or a national monument. Um, which meant the existing air quality has to be protected. That's, that's the shortest version of it. It can't be degraded. It's a voluntary thing. Class 1 airship designation, pretty big deal. Um, water quality, we were about the 13th tribe in the country to, to adopt water quality standards um, of how clean and clear water should be, what it should be able to be used for, and so on. Um, all kinds of um, environmental programs. We wrote management plans to protect the Mission Mountain Wilderness, which was designated in 1982. And then along with that, a strip adjacent to it, so you can't just really say, here's wilderness, and here's non-wilderness, right? Because here could be the McDonald's or the Walmart, and then here's the wilderness, right? Mm -hmm. That doesn't make sense. And so, so there was a buffer zone, well, Mission Mountain buffer zone, wilderness buffer zone. That was designated, and a management plan was first written for that about 1986. So again, at that time, we were the only tribes in the world to designate tribal wilderness. Now, this is not part of the federal wilderness system, but managed much the same, but with some different purposes. Among them, things like, no, we want our tribal people to go there and use this for cultural or religious purposes or just for solitude. Um, 
Yep. Yep. So in, in, by the 1990s, really, really cool things had happened. One of them was the tribes had assumed management responsibility for every single program the Bureau of Indian Affairs had ever run here. Every single one of them. Even the $27 that they used to give them for fisheries. So that's a real number. $27 the Bureau provided for fisheries management. The tribes compacted it. They compacted uh, forestry programs, roads programs, realty programs, title plant, all kinds of things, that services that the Bureau of Indian Affairs provided. There is essentially no Bureau of Indian Affairs function here left except we have a superintendent and his job is to represent individual tribal members who own their own land. And again, this is still the paternalistic system that we live in. If I own land on the Flathead Reservation and I want to cut timber on my own land, I have to have the Bureau of Indian Affairs okay it. Very true, very true. If I own fee land on the reservation and I would like to have it converted to trust, I have to have the federal government's permission. And I have to say something like, I need assistance with managing my land. That's what they want you to write. I went through this process not very long ago. It's interesting stuff. Anyway, a lot of cool stuff though. Peregrine Falcons, I was a part of that. Um, we wanted to reintroduce peregrine falcons. We did so around the Nine Pipes area when I worked in the wildlife program. Uh, leopard frogs, worldwide declines in amphibians, a lot of reasons we don't really know why. Oh, uh, West, uh, leopard frogs were one of those uh, species that have been in decline. Uh, trying to reintroduce them somewhat unsuccessfully. They're doing great up in Browning. So we go up there and get egg masses and then reintroduce them in places around Pablo and whatnot. And then these little leopard frogs are hitchhiking back up the high line or something. We don't know where they go. But, but they, they continue to try to work on that. Uh, one of the really cool things has been trumpeter swan reintroduction. Um, really big, spectacular birds. The largest North American waterfowl. Um, that's been uh, a really cool thing to see. And we also received significant funding from things like uh, Kerr Dam. Again, I was talking about Buddy. Uh, he and I worked on some studies where we had to, the, the goal was to look at the effects of the water level fluctuation from the dam. Kerr Dam used to change all the time, all the time. Six vertical feet in an hour. And if you think just vertical feet and then think of the slope of a shoreline, how much area that is. But it would not be uncommon for someone to pull their boat up on shore and walk around and then the boat, the water level would come up and the boat would float off. <laughs> it happened to me. <laughs> yeah, my guy I was working with had to swim for the canoe and almost drowned trying to get it. I didn't realize he wasn't a very good swimmer. <laughs> but anyway, so water levels went up and down, up and down for 80 years because of Down. And there was an act passed in 1980 called the Northwest Power Act that directed Bonneville Power to look at all of those dams all across the Pacific Northwest. What are the effects of anything, uh, these fluctuating water levels? And if there are if if impacts, they need to be quantified and somebody needs to pay, meaning the dam operators. So there was um, about $18 million, I believe, from the Kerr settlement and that was used to um, write a plan to manage for bull trout. And it was used to acquire riparian resources similar to those that had been impacted. Good job. Good job. Um, and then the um, ARCO settlement was, was another big one. And I don't recall the numbers, but it was comparable. Um, from all of the mining that took place around the Butte Silver Bowl area, um, we decided basically we can't do anything to fix that area, but what we can do is work in a place really comparable, which is the Jocko Valley and a, a still a bull trout stronghold. In terms, it's a core recovery area for bull trout. Um, and just on that, um, the Salish and Ponderay people in particular were really known for, fisher, for, for their fishery and for their fishing abilities. And so were the Kootenai. And when you think about it, I mean, there were, there were some songs. I know the Kootenai people had songs about bull trout and so forth. But particularly in the wintertime, I mean, think about it. We're pretty lucky how we live today. We have a lot of modern conveniences. We have a lot of technology at our disposal. But historically, our tribal people in the wintertime in particular, um, it was tough. 
our people were tough and they were resilient. And one of the things that they learned to do was camp along waterways in the wintertime. <laughs> where their winter camps were, you know why? They might not be able to get any other source of food, but they knew they could get fish. And those bull trout were big. There were pictures of, of them hanging off the back of a horse and nearly dragging the ground. We don't know how big the horses were, but we know how big the fish were. Yeah. So that's part of what, when we talk about bull trout, it isn't, you know, like, we're just, you know, we like bull trout. It was a significant um, staple in our in our people's history it, it represented survival it represented food security um, that's why bull trout were important so those, those two current arco sources were very very important so now because all things are connected we're back to where we started aren't we <laughs> here is the new tribal council chambers that were built and your hot spring students again <laughs> Um, the government continued to grow capability and, and the big, big, huge historic thing that we did, September 5th of 2015, we became the first tribe in the country again to own a major hydroelectric facility. Now we're all enjoying low, electric, low electrical rates right now. Not real good for our energy corporation that we have because energy generation in terms of electrical um, kilowatt hour prices is at an all-time low. So we don't make money like we thought we would. It's an unfortunate thing. In fact, we are, uh, well, I, I don't know where we're at, but uh, I'm told that we're trying to weather the storm as far as we're not rolling in money because we own the dam. In terms of the price per unit, we were thinking somewhere in the 70 to $80 per unit, whatever the unit is. We're down about 14 or 20 right now, which again, which is great for us when we go to pay our power bills. And in part, it's due to, we're told it's due to the abundance of natural gas that's been produced from fracking um, uh, gasoline or, or oil, I should say, crude oil. That those natural gas deposits that are associated with those oil deposits are being they're so, they're so abundant because of so much fracking. That's what we're being asked to believe is why, except when you need it in North Dakota or South Dakota, natural gas is very cheap. And so that affects electrical generation rates. Anyway, so that's where we are. And um, that's what I have for you today. And I would be glad to try to answer any questions that are anything that might be on your mind that either was or wasn't part of the presentation. Yes? Um, you talked about some creatures that uh, lived <coughs> on this planet at the same time as humans in the early days. And they, I guess they ate people or, well. That's what the name translates to, yes. What were they like? I mean, were they giants? Were they reptiles? Giants? What, what are those creatures? My understanding was they were pretty large. They were, they were extremely large, I mean, that would stretch from one end of a valley to, to the other, for example. But I don't know, I don't know too much about that part. I, I know that there, but there is a, a time in, right after creation when that was the reality. Okay. Right here and then right there. Uh, in Missoula, there are three good-sized plaques that are down near the waterfalls near the pavilion and the carousel. And on next to the last line on one of the plaques, it says that the Sahelish people never signed the treaty. Um, what happened was, um, in particular, Chief Charlo did not sign the treaty. And his name, his ex was what they used, and they forged it. And then, But the, the original document was subsequently uncovered. And I don't know why this was not the original document, but the original document, like in the National Archives, does not have an X next to his name. Wouldn't this be grounds then for uh, major litigation against the uh, federal government to reclaim all of the Indian lands that were taken in this state? Well, it, that's possible. It's, it, there's a little more to the story than that. There was a couple of unconnected events in the 60s and I think early 70s whereby it was determined that some of the land takings the tribes were never compensated for 
or they were they were not properly compensated for, which resulted in I don't know a few million dollars that were were paid to to the tribal people. And I, I remember when I was about when was that big settlement? Gene, do you remember? It was seventy? You and I are about the same age. Seventy-two. 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 We each got. Some dollars. Four thousand for the first go around, two thousand next go around. Yeah. So yeah. So I, I remember we bought a piece of land. With my dad said that we were going to buy land because each of us kids even got that settlement. So so there there was some compensation. I, I do I do see your point though. Yes. Yeah. You said that uh, you have sovereignty over clean air and that. So. Can something be done about the chemtrails? I understand that there's more chemtrails in Montana than any other state, and that they're targeting the Indian reservation. Well, that's a source of frustration for me. I, I, I think, in general, any for me, it's just gravel roads. I mean, the the issue is, can you prove that it's Permanently degrading the airship below what's allowed. That's that's the issue, and that's a scary one. I mean, think about. It. I mean, we we have issues. Let's be real. We have issues. If if you want to shoot a deer on your own land, we're going to come after you. <coughs> Say no, you can't do that. That potentially harms us because if everybody does it, there won't be any deer left, and that's on your own land. I mean, imagine the air over. How do we how do we regulate that? That's a tough one. I mean, we, we say it and we have, we monitor in certain communities, but I mean, what, the, what it really means? In a lot of cases, for example, with water, it means we ask people voluntarily to not do something that may, may degrade water quality, for example. Uh, if one was to have a question to ask you that's pretty complicated, is there any way that we can get a touch with you? No, there isn't. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, Take his class. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me do something here really quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Will you be sticking around for a while? Hold on, hold on. Let me, let me just do something here really, really, really quick. What I'll do is I, I should have put this up here. Watch me work for a minute. Okay, could I, could so I ask you a question while you're... Okay. Yes. Well, I, I'm just curious of any of the history of hot springs because it, it's curious to me of living on a reservation and there's very few tribal members who stay here. It's mostly non-tribal. And I have heard my own, um, but I'd love to hear from you of why, why that is. Huh? Um. Um, how come nobody lives in hot springs? How come no Indians live in hot springs? Well, I mean, I, I've, I've, I've heard that this is a place to come and visit and not a place to stay, but I'd like to hear from you of what you know. I don't have a good answer for that one, but I know that not to make not to make light of it at all. But you know, like when you live in Hot Springs, if you're going to town, you're going to Plains. You know, if you're going to go shopping for stuff other than everyday items, you're going to go to Plains. You're going to go to Missoula. You're going to go to Kalispell. That's a haul. Um, or Pol or you could go to Polson, but that's that's close to an hour's drive. I, I don't I don't have a good answer, but you hold on. Sorry, you had a question next, and then, then you hold on. Um, before you mentioned that uh, the Salish and the Kootenai have gotten together in a, a, in a government <coughs> council, are the Pondere now in the tribal council? 
Are they still represented in, on the reservation? One of the things that happened when the dam was purchased was they, I don't know if you guys remember, they initially named it Salish Kootenai Dam. Uh -huh. Some Ponderay people got mad uh -huh. and said, once again, we're being forgotten. Yeah. And so then the dam was renamed and there has been, I think, a little bit of a resurgence among people who identify as Ponderay to remind people, you know, we are still a, a separate and distinct tribe. Mm -hmm. There are three tribes here. And I didn't know this. The term Confederated Salish means the Salish people and the Ponderay oh, people. Okay. And then, so it's Confederated Salish <coughs> and Kootenai. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yes. And Janelle, answer your question. Native Amer old Native American saying, if, why there's more white people here than there are Native Americans. Only a white person would cut a foot off the top of a blanket, sew it onto a bottom blanket, and think you had a water blanket. <laughs> Hot Springs is a good town. I mean, it's just out there. I mean, it's 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 all the beach. Exactly. Yeah, and I have you see, I have a bias. I mean, I'm Mission Valley. You know, that's me. I'm I'm from the Mission Valley. You know, you're, we're used to you know a nice straight line shot to the nearest large urban center to do something. Yes, Mr. Campbell. Hey, this is Ken. Ken. Ah, my name is Ken. So she named Kumque, I am Ponderay, Upper Ponderay. One of her names for us was uh, Steph Quetcom CT, and that was the, the Lake Peddlers. My mom had a allotment out about 10 miles down the river. And then during the war, she found a way to get to Portland, Oregon, and she became one of the Rosie the Riveters. And she met my father, who was from Monroe, North Carolina. They met at a service dance, and the rest is history. But once they experienced that, and they came back to the reservation, and they went to their allotment along the river, which, as you guys here know, you know how to garden, and you know how to use the land the way it's meant to be. He had gardens, he had orchards, he had the fish, he had the river, but it was a hard goal. Mm -hmm. And she ended up training, training uh, her 160 acres and it somehow got whittled down to 80 acres because they said this 160 acres here is different than the 160 acres up along the mountains. Mm -hmm. Somehow they reduced it. My dad, Hazel Camels from Monroe, North Carolina, had some experience working on ranches and farms, so he ended up working for H.O. Bell. Anybody ever remember H.O. Bell? H.O. Yeah. Bell Ford. He was a millionaire. You ever heard of uh, Johnson Bell Field, mm -hmm. the airport? He was one of the first ones that supported that building of that airport. And once he retired, he moved up to the reservation and bought a bunch of land right next to Mount Kalawakan. Anybody remember that name? It used to be called Mount Harding, right behind Kicking Horse Job Corps. But he went in there and bought out a bunch of the allotments. And I'll end here is that I was always wondering why all the Indians moved up behind Kicking Horse Job Corps. Uh, you had a picture up there of M Mount Kalawakan. Mm -hmm. That's one of our sacred vision quest sites. Mm -hmm. But all my life, I remember just looking at this white man with all this land driving around in a, a Thunderbird, Ford Thunderbird. And, but he, we got the work, we had to work those long hours, but I think our dad was trying to t teach us, look at there's a man with money. Mm -hmm. How did he get that money? Mm -hmm. You work hard, you de educate yourself, maybe one day you'll have that money. Even though know, you work for $160 a, a month, and you raise 14 kids on that, so you can just imagine 
what, he, what message he was trying to tell us. So, all I'm saying is that while there's not a lot of Indians here, there's still Indians here. But a lot of them have died and a lot of them have moved off and maybe they wanted to get back over along the mountains. But this is one of my mom's original home sites was on the river down here. And I'll end with this story is that she used to tell me a story about uh, going to Dixon. And they used to have a buckboard and her dad just like you said, all those horses. I was going to ask Billy what happened to all the horses, but that's a tragic tale in itself. So her dad told her that she had to stay home that day, but she wanted to go with him because she used to love walk riding on that buckboard. So as he took <coughs> off, she decided that she was going to run along the river. And so she was a runner. So by the time she got to Dixon, here comes her dad riding up in his, his buckboard. And there's my mom standing alongside the road. He said, what are you doing here? You know, I'm supposed to stay at home. So if you're ever in Polson, at the courthouse, on the third floor, there's a bunch of placards of all the schools that were, you know, around this reservation. There used to be over 40 community schools, they call them. But in there's one on the south south uh, wall, there's a picture of a drawing of a guy uh, riding, driving a herd of horses on a buckboard. And then there's a picture of a little log house. And in that little log house door, there's this little child sitting there, right? So I went up there and I looked at that and I said, I recognize that. And it said, Sketch by Ken Campbell. Uh, That's who I am. Uh, <laughs> then I started looking at it and I said, well, I remember Dovetail Magazine. I used to work as the illustrator for the school magazine. Then I started looking at the artwork. And I said, I don't draw mountains like that. Those are those little bluffs along the river down here, right? So I started looking at it closer and I says, I would draw grass like that. <laughs> then I said, that, I didn't draw that. That's my mom's drawing. <laughs> but they put my name sketched by Ken Camelet. <laughs> so if you're ever up there, that's kind of... We should take a look, huh? Uh, take a look at that. Thank you very much. Um, I think that William's going to stick around. So if you have any more questions, um, he'll be happy to answer them. And we do have a potluck happening. So, we'll so privately, though, I'll probably just make up some answer for you. <laughs> this, um, for a lot of money, do it. We're very happy that William Swanny came today. Yeah. from 12 to 5. We have 25 to 30 kids here. This is funded by the tribe. Um, we feel very fortunate that we have the money to provide these services for the kids. Um, we have Ariel with Raven, which is the kids just love. We have lots of arts and crafts. We have gardening. We have storytelling. There's all sorts of good things that are happening. We're going to have swimming at the Symes. Uh, Leslie's been kind enough to offer the pool to us um, once a week in July and some in June. Um, so we have a whole schedule of things and we're really serving a population that needs to be served and we're really happy about that. So we thank the tribe for your funding and we hope it continues. Um, and let's eat. <laughs> Michael, yeah.